This is the headquarters flag that was used at Port Hudson for the, all the United States colored troops. Uh, it was important at Port Hudson because that was the first time blacks actually saw action. The commander of the third division was Cyrus Hamlin, who was the son of the vice president, uh, Hannibal Hamlin under in, uh, Abraham Lincoln. And so this was their headquarters flag. In May 27th of 1863 was the first time black troops actually saw action, and that was at Port Hudson. They didn't win the battle though, but they, they fought gallantry and gallantly and uh, made history. And after that, the North realized that blacks could fight and uh, they used them for the remainder of the war. This is a rare pattern, 35 star U.S. garrison flag that flew over Port Hudson. It was in the, one of the forts that protected New Orleans from during the Civil War. This, the fort had fallen in 62, and when 35 states joined the Union, this was, flag was brought to the fort and flew over it. It was brought home as a souvenir by uh, Lieutenant Green of the 12th Connecticut. New Orleans had a pretty unique culture in that uh, we had Creoles, which were both white and black, and this image reflects on that. There's the white soldier on the left and his half-brother um, half who's mulatto on his right. This is New Orleans' Dick's Note. A lot of people believe this is where the term Dixie came into play because it's a $10 note from Citizens Bank, 10, Dix meaning uh, 10 in French. There's a lot of these uncirculated Dix notes that people believe is the true Dix notes, but the real Dix note is to its right. You can see this is a, a $10 note that was actually used. Those are the ones that were in circulation. Uh, but that's how the term Dixie came in because you would be paying, give me one of those Dixies, being paying in $10 notes. Well, General Beauregard was um, from New Orleans. He was Creole, and he had some Sicilian background, too. And he became a famous general in the Confederacy. But a lot of people don't realize he was actually one of the first people to start the civil rights movements after the Civil War. No one remembers that part. But uh, he helped pick the Confederate battle flag by William Portia Miles, who was the owner of Homer's House. Uh, makes them pretty important. This is a rare slave broadside. It's in French and it was printed in New Orleans in the 1850s. It announces the sale of slaves at the Banks Arcade, which no longer exists. There's a portion of it around Gal uh, Gravia Street in New Orleans that's now a hotel, but it used to be a building that took a block long, it was about a block long, and it had a bunch of um, stores in it. And part of it would be a weekly sale of slaves. This is all in French, and if you look very closely, you can see written in pencil some of the things by the, um, the person who owned it, such things like a, a good slave has good teeth, stuff like that, which is pretty amazing. Well, we all knew that the Underground Railroad actually existed, but some of the stories that came afterwards involved the use of quilts that would help tell the runaway slaves where to go and where you would be protected. And a lot of the research shows now that it probably didn't really exist because a lot of these pattern quilts that supposedly you hung outside your house to say you were safe zone didn't come around to the 1870s, so. This is a carved doll that was found in a slave cabin in Louisiana. It had fallen off a door frame. And my interpretation of it is that it's an African with an African skirt that's praying as if he was Catholic, which makes me think it's a voodoo doll. It would be put at the top frame of a door so that when you walked underneath it, it would cast away any evil spirits going into the house. This is a small ebony bust done in 1870s. 
the bust is carved on ebony. The eyes are ivory, the lips are coral, his earrings are solid gold. And it is marked on the back, ASG 1865. And I, I believe it could be done by the sculptor Augustus St. Gardens, who's very well known for doing um, monuments after the Civil War and also helping create one of the gold, so, uh, gold dollars for the U.S. government. Most of the sculptures of the time showed African Americans as caricatures, stereotypes. Um, with embellished facial features. This was the first bus that was done that showed dignity to the African male. This is a scene of a Civil War era amputation scene, which was more of a field hospital. Uh, you have to understand that the doctors followed the troops in the battle, and then when the casualties started coming in, they used a commandeer a house, and they needed a quick operating room. So what they would do is take a door off the hinges, throw it over a couple of barrels, and that would be the operating table. Unfortunately, they didn't know about germs. They didn't wash their hands. And uh, that's the most common cause of death. It wasn't really from the amputation. It was from the cat gut suture that they were doing, using to tie off the bleeders that got the person infected and gangrenous. The Civil War era of surgery is actually a step backwards because in the pirate days where they would amputate you, they would cauterize the wound with a flame which would kill all the bacteria. But during the Civil War, the surgeons thought those, that was a barbaric way of doing it. So they would tie off the bleeders with cat gut suture but didn't know about infection. So the person would survive the operation and then only to die later of gangrene or infection.